Okay, welcome back to our discussion of medieval Europe and the time of Charlemagne. So let's pick back up where we left off. We were going to talk about religion. Uh, is the screen share working? Sorry, just let me check this. Yeah, okay. So Charlemagne's, uh, the religion in the time of Charlemagne. I mentioned that there was a lot of debate over religion in this time period. And the main debate we have is a division between East and West. Um, like I said, the idea of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, being the leader of the church was not accepted everywhere. Um, and it was especially not accepted in the Byzantine Empire and in the East. Um, today, uh, the Eastern Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church is now most uh, popular in Greece, uh, pretty much all of Greece, uh, some parts of the Middle East and Russia are all connected to this church or branches off of this church. Um, whereas the sort of um, uh, Christ form of Christianity that's known in uh, Europe and Latin America, or I should say Catholic Europe, um, is uh, the Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, but their na names both mean the traditional uh, church. So what we really have to think about is the division between East and West. Um, and why would there be a division between East and West here? Well, we definitely had that with uh, the centers of power, right? R this whole Western Roman Empire just completely uh, disintegrated. Meanwhile, we still have the Eastern Roman Empire over here ca being called the Byzantines by historians. Um, and these two uh, areas don't really talk to each other a lot. Um, they were kind of corresponding with the churches, but there are some differences. For instance, over here, people speak Latin, and over here, people speak Greek. So they have an inherent barrier to understanding each other. And when they make theological arguments, uh, they can pretty quickly come to different uh, opinions. Um, so um, there is a real translation problem between these two parts of the world. So it makes a lot of sense that they would grow apart. And the big way that they grow apart, the th big thing that these two churches still can't really reconcile on today um, is this idea of there being one leader of the church versus multiple leaders of the church. Um, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, um, was considered, is considered by uh, Roman Catholicism to be the leader of the church because Jesus said, uh, St. Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Uh, Peter became the first Bishop of Rome and he established a church there. So according to that line of thinking, um, that is the reason to make the B uh, Bishop of Rome the most important figure. Um, according to the other line of thinking, the, uh, the Church of Rome is just one of many churches. And that seems to be how maybe it was thought of in the time of Constantine. Um, there were many churches um, including the one in Constantinople, but uh, there are actually seven uh, important churches um, in uh, the Byzantine Empire. Constantinople is maybe their sort of first among equals, their semi-leader, but uh, none of them has a voice among the others. Instead of there being the Pope, there are the seven uh, patriarchs, and all of them answer to a council. So it's a much more sort of uh, loosely spread form of authority and they do not believe that the Pope has special authority over them. Um, so those are some of the differences. Other differences that emerge along the way um, is that the, they have a different understanding of the nature of the Trinity, uh, the Holy Spirit coming from uh, the Father versus coming from the Son and the Father. Uh, the Western Church uses unleavened bread, um, no yeast uh, for the Eucharist, um, where you take communion whereas the uh, Orthodox Church uses is leavened bread. Um, so it's more like, it's kind of a cracker versus, um, versus loaf situation or biscuit situation. Um, so uh, those divisions made the churches gradually grow apart over time. And over time, this division got worse and worse until in the year 1054, schism. This is a term for a religious um, falling apart, a religious division appearing is a schism. And these two groups mutually excommunicate each other. So basically the Western church says, you uh, people in the East aren't going to heaven. And the East says right back at you. 
Um, so uh, this schism emerged and you can see where the lines are being drawn here. And they look pretty similar to what parts of the world um, these two forms of Christianity are popular in today. Um, so uh, we might be somewhat familiar with um, Ro the Roman Catholic tradition, but the Orthodox tradition, uh, there's a little bit more I want to talk about there. One of the things that makes it unique is the idea of the icon. Um, so uh, the icon is a form of art and a form of religion, I guess you could say. A very popular um, way of connecting to the saints. Um, so both traditions have the belief uh, that um, you can connect to God through the saints. Now you don't worship the saints, you venerate the saints, you respect them, you call on their power to help you in some ways. You can ask them for help, uh, but that's a different thing from believing that they're gods, they're just more like important figures who God has given spiritual power to. And so the icon is an image of one or more of these saints. Uh, you call on them, and the saint will bless you and, uh, you know, help you with some sort of problem in your life. So you can understand why something like that would be pretty popular. And there are images in Roman Catholicism that have um, uh, sometimes a similar effect. There's other forms of venerating the saints that are kind of like this. Uh, but the style of doing things, the art style is very distinctly uh, Byzantine or Greek. Uh, this golden backing is something you see very often in Byzantine uh, religious art or Greek religious art. Now, interestingly, in the Byzantine Empire, these were actually pretty controversial um, at various points. Uh, because you remember how I said that uh, Judaism and especially Islam has strong views about making images in a religion, in a religious context? Well, uh, the icon, what is an icon but an image? It's literally just Greek for image. Um, and so uh, because of being an Abrahamic tradition, it was feared that these might be kind of uh, causing, kind of violating that commandment from God. Um, sure, you don't make images of God, but can you make images of his holy saints? And if you do, are you just kind of worshiping the saints? That's kind of the subject that's up for debate. So that led to iconoclasm, which is Greek for image breaking. Uh, so there's this whole fury and sort of social debate as to destroying the images. Um, and um, various uh, patriarchs and emperors of uh, Byzantium, of Constantinople, uh, denounced the images as unholy, as, you know, destroying your relationship to God. And it's important that the emperors get involved in this because they have a lot of power to make these decisions and they can influence people among the patriarchs. Um, but eventually um, where it came down to was um, that uh, iconoclasts were decided that those guys were the heretics, uh, not um, the people who uh, venerated the icons and used the icons, that Christianity officially believed um, that, or at least this form of Christianity, officially believed that you could venerate these saints in this way. And this is an issue that's going to come up again between Protestants and Catholics and things like that. But um, finally, the emperors made and the patriarchs made an official final declaration that stuck. And that had a lot to do with a lady called Empress Irene. But, you know, it may have been that being so close to the caliphates, um, these other emperors who were iconoclasts, they really wanted to show that they were more connected to God than the Muslims. And so they, you know, felt that they had to try harder or something like that. But eventually came around to the position, which is still held today, that, yeah, icons are okay. So talking about this Empress Irene, she is one of the most interesting Byzantine emperors. I would say, you know, um, after Justinian, she's definitely... Uh, the my second favorite. Um, and uh, Irene is interesting because, as you're noticing, she's an empress. Uh, we didn't really see that throughout our history of Rome, um, uh, of Western Rome anyway. Um, it's a very rare thing. Usually women have to rule through their sons. Um, and Empress Irene uh, tried that for a while, but eventually she seized power for herself. So she, she wasn't even related by blood to the emperor. She was married into it. And then her son was briefly in power with her as the power behind the throne. Uh, but then she took over from him. 
she had to fight him for control. And eventually she did a very powerful move, which she um, uh, took him and had him blinded um, instead of killing him. She said, I'm not going to kill you, but I am going to uh, blind you. And uh, to add sort of a more power to this, she actually did this in the very room which she had given birth to him. Uh, which was a special room at this point. The um, uh, Byzantines had this whole tradition around emperors being born in a purple room, uh, born in the purple, they said. So yeah, so she was quite a, a, a powerful figure. Um, one, of, uh, one of these characters you see in shows like Game of Thrones. Um, and uh, she was very involved in the ending of iconoclasm. She made a decree that iconoclasm was over and icons were okay now. At several points, she tried to uh, dissolve the schism between the Eastern and Western churches. She tried to reach out to the Western church, but it ultimately didn't last. Uh, she also uh, tried to reach out to uh, the Western people in power, including Charlemagne. Uh, here's an interesting historical fact that most people don't talk about. At one point, a marriage alliance was proposed between uh, Charlemagne and Empress Irene, which would have been quite potent. Um, it, this would have been, you know, maybe the ultimate power couple for the time period. They would have had both the East and the West um, uh, incorporated under them. It wouldn't have quite been the Roman Empire, but they would have gotten really darn close um, between her having all the emperors in Constantinople and him having this sort of new emperor thing. But in the end, um, uh, the politics of Byzantium um, uh, led to this not happening. Um, which, as I said, it could be quite Byzantine, as in complicated. Uh, so uh, her senators in the city of Constantinople ultimately kind of blocked the idea and it fell apart. And then Charlemagne ended up going with Pope Leo um, and establishing firmly that he was uh, the, the new emperor, which, to which Irene said, no, you can't do that. I'm the emperor. So they had to ultimately oppose each other uh, because uh, you know, they couldn't both be emperor unless they got married, but that didn't end up happening. Now, I mentioned at the same time, we also have the uh, caliphate, specifically the Abbasid caliphate, uh, which lasts during this time period. Um, so uh, it's around in the 800s. It's also around in the 900s. But maybe its most notable figure is from the 800s. And this is Harun al-Rashid, uh, which would mean something uh, transliterated Harun is the same name as Aaron, and al-Rashid means the righteous. So Aaron the righteous um, was indeed, by all accounts, a pretty uh, respected and significant figure in the history of the caliphate. He was the creator of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. So just as uh, the Ptolemies set up the Library of Alexandria, uh, Harun set up uh, the House of Wisdom, which did all this sort of scientific investigation that wasn't really happening in, um, uh, in uh, Western Europe so much. Uh, studying astronomy, uh, preserving a lot of Greek and Roman knowledge that wasn't being preserved um, in other parts of the world. Uh, so in, term, if, in terms of us liking, if we like those things like big cities and big science and literature and things like that, he's, uh, he's our guy. Um, and because of that, he also appears in literature. Um, he uh, appears in the Thousand and One Nights as this sort of legendary good caliph. Um, he is, you know, this heroic leader. Um, he did fight with Irene at a couple points, um, but eventually they sort of made a, a non-aggression agreement, uh, sort of a brief peace, at least during their lifetimes. Um, and yeah, in general, he was just kind of presiding over part of this Islamic golden age. Um, and I think it's striking that all three of these folks were living around the same time period in the 800s and were uh, corresponding with each other. Um, the caliphate kind of started to go into more of its decline phase after his rule. Um, like Charlemagne, he had the problem that it split into pieces when his sons inherited it. Um, but uh, it still lasted a fairly long time after that. Um, unlike Charlemagne's empire, it kind of got back together. But um, one really fun thing is that he actually sent Charlemagne an elephant. Uh, by some accounts, it was a white elephant. Um, and this has been commemorated in um, various ways, um, paintings and, uh, of the elephant. And it was, led, it was brought to um, 
to Aachen, to Charlemagne's court in all the way in Germany, uh, by a man who was Jewish. So he was known as Isaac the Jew. Uh, so this was a very multicultural connection going on here, even in the middle of the European Middle Ages. And the name of the elephant was Abul Abbas, uh, which is just a, a really fun story. Apparently it took him two years to get it across the sea and back into, um, back into Aachen. But I bet Charlemagne really enjoyed having an elephant in Germany. Uh, Harun also uh, left a pretty lasting legacy. Uh, there are some mosques that date from his time period. Eventually his city was kind of burned down by the, a group of people known as the Mongols. Um, but uh, during the time had this beautifully laid out circular city. It was a ringed wall and then these square, uh, the square, this sort of square division in the middle into four parts. Um, so a uh, pretty cool time period uh, in Baghdad, as I said. Uh, but getting back to uh, Charlemagne here, uh, he did some other things that were cool. Um, as you can tell by, with his relationship with uh, Isaac, um, he had a pretty positive interaction with uh, the Jews. Um, so there were positive relationships between Christians and Jews in this time period. Now, on the other hand, uh, there was some tension too. Um, and during the Middle Ages, uh, this is kind of the origin of some tension between Christians and Jews. During the Middle Ages, Christians banned the practice of what's called ursary, which is basically being a banker who charges interest or lending money with interest. And Christianity banned that, at least during this time period. Now, the problem was that this kind of became stereotyped as uh, the Jewish occupation. Um, because Jews could do it and Christians could not. So the Jews ended up kind of filling that niche in society, in part because sometimes they were banned from other jobs too. Um, unfortunately, this led to this stereotype of Jews as being greedy and wanting money, which is not true. I hope I don't need to say that, um, but that's where the stereotype comes from, is this a time period where only Jews were able to be bankers. And so there's this real sort of uh, confusion that comes from this uh, stereotyping. Um, so Charlemagne um, was one of the people who banned this practice of money lending, which was not, not uh, anywhere in his kingdom, which was probably not great uh, for the Jewish people who were using that as a way to uh, survive in a world run by Christians. Um, but um, on, in other ways, he doesn't seem to have inherently thought that uh, being Jewish was a bad thing. Um, other things Charlemagne did. He was a big supporter of knowledge and literature in his kingdom. Um, and we, so we don't know about the rest of Europe, but he certainly was someone who supported knowledge and writing, which is pretty cool if that's something that's less well known in this time period. Um, he himself apparently could barely write, but he uh, took advantage of his connections to Rome to have his beloved daughters educated. He was really fond of his daughters and you know, uh, they had a really close relationship uh, from what the historical texts say. Um, but uh, this time period of knowledge is sometimes called the Carolingian Renaissance. Basically, this was a time when there's a lot of scholarship, a lot of knowledge, a lot of learning. Um, some of the Latin texts that we still use today come from this time period. They were imported um, from uh, Rome or even from, uh, from uh, the Caliphate up into uh, up into Aachen. And the one, some of the ones that we have today are based on those versions of the texts. And there's a new writing style that comes along in this er area, era, um, which I can barely read. I find it a little bit incomprehensible because it's very small. It's called minuscule because it's so small and close together. But it's the first time people use lowercase letters. Um, and in general, his time seems to have been pretty prosperous. He built schools, he made sure people were educated, he built a lot of cathedrals, and again, um, his uh, empire was divided amongst his sons, so it didn't really last. But it was quite a bright moment in the history of, you know, knowledge and learning, if that's what we want to emphasize here. Uh, the empire, so his empire crumbled, but it would have a lasting legacy. Uh, people kept trying to refer to this idea of, quote, the Holy Roman Empire in time periods after this. Um, there have basically been three Holy Roman Empires. There was one that was Charlemagne's. There was one in um, the 1100s under a guy called Barbarossa. And then Hitler came along 
And that's why he called his time period the Third Reich. By that time, it was thought of as a German thing, not as a German slash French thing, or as a really Roman thing. Um, but that's this idea of, uh, it shows how this idea continued of this empire in Germany running the world. Um, so that's kind of Charlemagne's big contribution to world history, and that's why he's important. And it's cool that we can look at some other people who are important in the 800s and see how they're connected as well. So things weren't really completely disconnected. Um, so we should bear that in mind and when we think about the medieval world. Okay, so I want to do one more video here, and that one I'm going to talk about some more medieval things uh, and um, like medieval cathedrals and, um, and uh, the feudal system. Um, and then I think that will kind of wrap us up for talking about these Middle Ages. So I'll see you in that video.